Joining us now is Sheito Atigari, with stories trending around the world. Hello, Sheito. Good morning, Welcome Dr. To this Ruben. Segment of the Money Show. <laughs> this is very, very different. Good morning, Dr. Ruben. Yes, good, it's morning, good, to have you here. good morning, Good morning, Sheito. Good to see you again. Good to see you and friend. good morning, Rufa. I've missed you. <laughs> I've missed you, my dear. Good to see you. <laughs> All right, then, starting what's trending with the Nigerian Air Force, which has ruled out the possibility of foul play in the death of Nigeria's first female combat helicopter pilot. Tolulokwe Arutile. The Air Force revealed in a news conference on Sunday that the death of flying officer Tolu Arutile was caused by brute force and severe injuries following a road traffic accident at the NAF base in Kaduna. The force spokesperson, Commodore Ibikunle Daramola, said the driver of the vehicle that knocked down the late officer, Nehemiah Adejo, and the two other occupants of the car will be handed over to the police for prosecution since it is a civil case. Now, this is a very interesting one because a lot of people had, you know, come out wondering what the problem was. Why is it that this person that had such a bright future ahead of her, why would she pass away at, you know, at the NAF base? But they've come out to say that clearly it was just an accident and they've handed it over to the Nigerian police force to take a look at. What do you think, Dr. Rubin? Well, I'll let uh, Adesua go first. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm, I mean, it's a sad story for anyone, and I can only imagine what the family is going through. I listened to an interview her sister had, and she said, you know, um, we cannot comprehend it. We understand how the bases are built with speed bumps. Mm. So what manner of speed did this driver uh, apply, mm. you know, that resulted to the loss of my sister? And she just said, you know, she believed in the Nigerian and forces to carry out a thorough investigation, which is what all of us are clamoring for and called for. Yes. Um, to say that they've ruled out that you know, it was just an accident, I hope this brings closure and soccer for the family. I don't know how it would, mm. but you know, it's just a sad, sad death. Yes, the young lady was a child of history on whose shoulders uh, rested um, a lot of hopes, both at the family level and also at the national level. You will recall that she was part of the first set of uh, uh, ladies to pass through the uh, Nigerian Air, Air Force or the Nigerian Defense Academy. She even went ahead to study in South Africa, where she also distinguished herself. So she was part of the uh, regular course, uh, 64 of the uh, NDA, and she distinguished herself in Operation Aiki, uh, which was a combat operation against the uh, Boko Haram. And she saw action, just 24 years, and then all of a sudden this tragedy. So it's a tragedy that touches the heart of uh, everyone. Now, the, uh, I was a bit concerned about how the Nigerian Air Force was handling the matter, because the first press statement that came uh, from the spokesperson of the Air Force uh, wasn't detailed enough. It was rather cryptic. Okay. But later on, uh, now they have had this second press statement. This second press statement, I think, in my view, has addressed the various concerns. Yes. Already there were persons who were making the point that, look, this was a case of murder or assassination yes. and that it should be investigated. I think on this program, we also asked for an investigation. Yes, we did. Now, it's good to see the Nigerian Air Force has done that investigation. Because even groups in Yoruba land, yes. where she comes from, they were even saying, look, this week there will be a, a public protest if the federal government did not come up with uh, details. Which is why I think it was very important for them to come out with this conference and say that this is actually what An the accident. situation is. Rufai, would you like to chime in here very quickly? I'm quite very sad, like everybody. Uh, I think the point that made me uh, cry was the interview her father granted, that he said he spoke to us at 1 o'clock that day and she said she wanted to rest a little bit, that when she, when she wakes up, she'll go do a photocopy uh, of some document. She'll go do photocopies of some document. And he called back, and he got a call around five that his daughter had passed. And that I can't get my mind over. And it's just in the space of four hours. But people can die every time or any time. Uh, but the most important thing, they've done their investigation. They've handed it over to the police. It's a civil case. For me, Let's just hope such never happens again. Uh, let's just hope it never happens again. And, and why I say that, I say that very strongly. 
especially at the Air Force Base. A lot of precaution needs to be taken. And let's just hope we never have a driver that doesn't have a valid driver's license get into a car in the Air Force Base any longer. Because I can keep on asking questions, but questions will not bring back the dead. That's the sad part. It's pitiable. And I, and I hope the federal government stands by the family in all of this. Yes, very uh, strong it's, points you've it's, made there. It's a sad one. Rufai. Now on to our next story. The hashtag justice for Izu is currently trending on Twitter after a user named legend Izu Madubweze took his life after a Twitter influencer named Nanichi Anese published his name and other names as men accused of rape. It was revealed that Izu reached out to Nani and asked to know who he raped, but she didn't have a good answer. Instead, she claimed the accuser wanted to remain anonymous. She later said the alleged victim said it was a non-physical sexual assault. He eventually committed suicide, and Nani has deactivated her account after Izu's suicide was made public. Nigerians have been reacting on Twitter, demanding justice for Izu. One Twitter user said... Izu was a promising young man. He grew his business from sewing in his house to owning a warehouse. He was smart, good, and had big dreams, and he couldn't handle the whole defamation. He left this wicked world that couldn't give him a chance to speak. Hashtag stop false rape accusations. Another Twitter user said, you can't accuse a man of assaulting you because you don't like his progress and drag his name in death even to the point where he takes his own life. Please, let your feminism over humanitarian intentions. The world has lost yet another good one. I mean, this is very sad. This news broke late last night. And for a very long time, a lot of people were looking for this Nana Chi person who, like I said, has deactivated her Twitter user account. And this just brings to light the conversations that women and men have been having about rape, because there are cases, however few they may be, where people are accused falsely, where women have been known to weaponize accusing men of rape. And in this situation, this is somebody that went ahead and took his life. I really do hope that the Nigerian police force hops on this and seeks justice for this young man. You know, I think we do not say it enough, and the message is not out there enough, that false accusation is as bad as... Um, victimizing the victims all over again yeah. and denying them justice just because you feel you know you have social media platform to voice out your your whatever it is yeah. and then you falsely accuse someone what happens to when the real rape cases come up well I think I mean we've said it over and over again the me too movement uh, you know uh, emerge also in Nigeria as has been in the case the case in other parts of the world. And rape is condemnable, which is not something that anybody can defend. And we have made a case on this program for a review of the laws in line with current realities. But however, what this case presents is that, look, there is a flip side to it. You can also have a situation whereby rape accusers, the Me Too uh, gang, uh, can abuse the trend, the privilege. Now, in this particular case of hashtag justice for Izu, we were told that Nani, the girl mm -hmm. in question, had once approached him for a relationship. And the, uh, and the guy turned her down. And then she decided on the basis of that uh, to take advantage of the uh, regime Me Too movement uh, to blackmail him. And, you know, people have different thresholds yeah. for handling certain things. And in this particular case, uh, the young man, uh, decided to commit suicide as a way of defending his reputation. What that means is that, look, there's still a lot of work to be done mm. in many regards. One, we need to ramp up our counseling mechanisms in Nigeria so that when people are also wrongly accused, they should have recourse to help. And there should be helplines, there should be counseling centers that people can go to where they should seek help. A person like uh, the nanny girl, yeah. you know, should be arrested because she can be, one way or the other, head directly responsible for this. And we have had a precedence before in Australia where, you know, a prominent uh, public figure was accused of rape. And then when the matter was investigated and it went to court, it was discovered that it was a wrong accusation and his uh, reputation was restored. We need to get to that point as part of the conversation around issues of rape, 
defamation and all of that. I mean, I'm curious to know what you think, Rufai. How can we stop this trend of false accusations? How do we properly manage these people that come forward to tell their stories? I mean, Dr. Abati, are there penalties for, strong, uh, for false accusation in those new laws we're pushing for? Because we need to put this out there too. No, uh, there are laws against uh, defamation. Defamation, okay. Yeah, so you just, within the criminal code. So, but there are no specific laws for false accusation within these new rape laws we are pushing for. No specific laws. No, that. not with regard to rape. But you, okay. can, you have the right to defend your reputation. Okay. I, and, and I think to a very large extent, and we need to be careful here. Uh, I think Tundu, it was Tundu that told me the story about a, a certain man that he broke up with his girlfriend and the girlfriend took him to Lion Building, falsely accused him of armed robbery and the likes and, and, and all sorts. Please, let us stop this. Because you are destroying other people, you are destroying their destiny, you are destroying everything about them. Please, if he says he doesn't want you, he doesn't want you. He doesn't want you, let him be. He's not doing. Just leave him alone. Likewise, men out there, if a woman says she doesn't want you, she doesn't want you, she's not doing. Don't rape her. And it shows you know, the inferiority, or I don't know what to call it in you, that when somebody says no to you, you want to go ahead and get what you want at all costs. This is wrong. And like you said, Dr. Abati, I think this, this Nami girl, wherever she is, she should be smoked out, and she should face the full rot of the law. She's killed somebody, one way or the other. I don't know if you guys are going to tell me first degree or second degree murder. She's killed, or manslaughter. She's killed somebody. And this is really very painful. She's maligned the man's character. This is another clear case of unfinished greatness. God knows what the bar will have been. Maybe it will have been another Casey Jabari or Louis Vuitton. You cut him short because he said no to you. Is that the end of the world? Yes, and Rufa, if I can come in here, it also taints, you know, other people who want to come out and say their stories because we already have this victim blaming, uh, you know, thing that exists where a victim, of, as soon as she comes out to say her story, people don't believe. So if we're having cases of persons that are accused falsely, it only makes it more difficult for rape victims to come out and tell their stories. It cannot be more correct. Yeah. Definitely. Yes, in Professor Akintenawa's language. Yes. You cannot be more <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Let's move on to our next story. Nigeria's Foreign Affairs Minister, Geoffrey Oyema, has tested positive for COVID-19. According to a tweet via his Twitter handle, the minister underwent his fourth COVID-19 test on Saturday at the first sign of a throat irritation, and the test returned positive. According to the minister, that is life. You win some, you lose some. I'm heading for isolation in a health facility. I'm praying for the best. The news came after Oyema announced that Nigerians that have been evacuated from France, Hungary, Romania, Poland, Norway, Germany, Holland, UK and Canada all tested negative before boarding for Nigeria on Sunday. President Mohamedou Buhari took to Twitter to say, I wish Adjofri Oyema a speedy recovery from COVID-19. Nigeria is eternally grateful for his diligence in attracting international support to defeat the pandemic and boost the economy. He has been a tireless worker and strong pillar of our administration. Another Twitter user said, you guys are funny. Fought COVID test when your compatriots haven't had the privilege of a single one, Animal Farm. Nevertheless, wishing you a quick recovery. Another Twitter user said, what do you think the job of a minister of foreign affairs is during a global pandemic with citizens stranded all over the world? It is standard routine for anyone involved in any part of the response to get tested regularly because they are more likely to get infected. Adesua, do you agree? Those in the front line should be tested as many times as possible, yeah. even though we have Nigerians that haven't been tested at all. Unfortunately, I think we should. Uh, that's where we'll find ourselves. All over the world, there's never enough testing for everybody. But there are some people that are critical to have this test. Um, perhaps people around, you know, seats of power, the presidents, the governors. And like we've seen all over the world, they are very susceptible because, you know, they have to carry on with their functions. We do wish uh, Mr. Oyema a quick recovery, like we mentioned earlier in the show. He was at the front line receiving all these Nigerians coming back. Um, the issue of testing, yes, <laughs> can be very controversial. It's had the fourth test. I know how some people can feel about that because our testing protocol has only just been reviewed, you know, to include more people. Initially, it was about symptoms. Now it's about being in a high-prone uh, uh, area or living in the same uh, 
house with somebody who has tested positive, but it's still not enough. Definitely it's still not, not enough. enough. I agree well, I mean, we join uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Geoffrey Onyama, in praying for the best. And once again, we wish him a speedy recovery. I mean, he has taken the test four times, only to test uh, positive the fourth time. And what that means, clearly, to everybody, is not just that the, uh, uh, the virus is egalitarian, it doesn't respect status, okay. but also that, look, you have to keep testing to be able to know your status. And the earlier you took the test, perhaps the uh, yeah. better. And, it, you know, it's a bit uh, very touching in his own case. You recall that he wrote uh, a famous essay when uh, Mala Mabakiari uh, died as a result of COVID-19 uh, complications. And he had been best man, uh, you know, at the wedding of uh, Mala Mabakiari, yes. I think, or is it the other way around? The other way around, you know, and now he himself, uh, you know, has uh, COVID-19. And he says, that's life. That, for me, defines it. It's a very loaded uh, statement. But sometimes life gives you, uh, you know, a curved world, throws yeah. a curved ball in your direction. But I'm sure that yeah. now that, uh, you know, he's been detected early, we should continue to pray for him. As the president pointed out in his uh, statement, uh, he has been one of the frontliners yes. in the battle against uh, COVID-19. And with all that he has done, you know, bringing back people facilitating the return of uh, stranded Nigerians mm -hmm. and uh, also working hand in hand with other departments of government. Uh, you know, he has discharged himself honorably. So he says he's going to an isolation center. Uh, we look forward to his uh, return his to, his, uh, to his beat. <laughs> yes. yes. Rufai. I wish him a very speedy recovery. I want him to get well, uh, Dr. Abati pointed out that emotional connection to Abba Kiari being very... I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Abba Kiari is even one of the godfathers to his son or one of his, uh, you know, offspring. So it's quite a very deep connection and I wish him very speedy recovery. But also, people that have been close to Godfrey Oyema in the space of one week or two weeks should be tested. Everybody around him, we should contact trace him. Where has he been? Where has he gone to? Has he gone anywhere? Uh, maybe the people he met with, did he go to the villa? Let's contact Trace and test all of them. I, I think that's just the due protocol. And like you said, COVID is not a respecter of persons. Uh, it can happen to anybody now that we even hear it's airborne. So let's take precaution. But apart from Godfrey Oyema just saying, I tested positive, this is when I expect the N uh, 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 NCDC to go out there and contact Trace Godfrey Oyema. Has his wife been tested? Has his, uh, has his family members been tested? And things like that. This is the time to swing to action as regards that. But we wish him the best, like he said. And we're praying for it. He will get out of this Definitely. and he will get better. Definitely he will be wishing him a speedy recovery. Now moving on to the Academic Staff Union of Universities has said it supported the decision of the federal government to stop senior secondary school third pupils from participating in the West African Senior School Certificate Examination earlier scheduled for August the 4th. The union advised the government to shut down schools until 2021 to ensure adequate preparations, citing the cases in some countries such as Kenya. Minister of State for Education Chukwemeka Nwadioba had also said the government would consult with the four other member countries of WIEC to set a new date while announcing COVID-19 mandatory guidelines for schools, which must be kept before July 29th. Here's what some Nigerians had to say on Twitter. One user said, FG should stop paying ASU, then let's see what the next deadline would be. They are enjoying free money while being lazy and they don't want it to stop. Open our schools and don't let your selfishness make us lose a whole year. Hashtag save Nigerian students. Another Twitter user said, final year students resuming to complete their thesis, graduate and SS3 resuming to finish their exams. While observing safety protocols is not throwing caution to the wind. There will be enough space for social distancing. This set of people can't just be left in, in limbo. The last tweet there says, we cannot have students remaining at home idle for long. If you do not want students in school, provide other means for them. The private sector have collected school fees and concluded their sessions online. When federal universities have not even started the first semester. Hashtag Hatsu.
And this what, <laughs> this is what happens when ASU is involved in too many strikes uh, and industrial action. People think that, you know, this is another <laughs> advantage to just stay <laughs> home and collect those monies. Yes. Um, but the ASU president made a good point. He mentioned Kenya, but Kenya doesn't write uh, WASC, uh, WASC or they're not part of, uh, you know, they don't write that exactly. They're not one of the five countries. Mm -hmm. uh, however, Kenya has indeed shut down schools to next year. They're not taking any chances. It's, it's, it's just a lot to take. It's a lot to give. Uh, even if you're going to reopen schools, there are so many things you need to put in place. And you have to ask, are we ready to do that? Yeah, People say, oh, you, this protocols, these children are old enough. They, yes. But how many schools have running water? How would we provide water? Mm. Some health facilities don't even have water. How are you going to provide that? Even, ap even after water, it's really also about the discipline of the children. Because even as adults, you find adults flaunting these precautionary measures all the time. Talk less of children who cannot be monitored by teachers at all times. So at one end, we're looking at it, we do we want these children to stay at home? For one year, but if they go to school, I won't be adding to the spread of COVID 19. It's dicey, it's dicey. Well, and it's it's better to, to be uh, safe than yeah. sorry. Yeah. And the children are particularly vulnerable mm -hmm. because, in terms of attitude and psychology, uh, it may be very difficult, you know, to uh, force children to observe physical distancing or social distancing. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn the lessons from other parts of the world. Uh, you cited the example of uh, Kenya, yeah. you referred to it. But look at South Korea. Uh, they took all the necessary precautions. The schools opened. They had to shut down the schools uh, again. Uh, look at uh, the example of northern Spain, the northern part of Spain. They tried to reopen the schools. They had to shut down the schools again. Mm. And at a time when the positivity rate is even going up globally, yeah. and it's even going almost higher in Nigeria, mm -hmm. despite the fact that we're not doing enough testing. I think it's better to be cautious. And it's not only us that is saying, look, we need to be cautious. Yeah. The Nigeria Medical Association, the Nigeria Labor Congress mm -hmm. are all saying that we should be careful. Even the Nigerian Union of Teachers, which is an association that should know, mm -hmm. they are also saying be careful. The only people who seem to be saying, let's reopen the school, is the National Association of private proprietors of schools mm. who claim that they are ready and they have all the protocols in place. Mm. But I think the onus is on the federal government and the state ministries of education, or if you like, the state governments, uh, to be vigilant mm. in looking at the protocols. But as a parent, I would rather say, look, let's keep the uh, children at home still mm. uh, in, in under protective custody <laughs> and then wait till <laughs> we see that uh, the situation has improved. Luckily, the race for the vaccine uh, is moving yeah, very fast. Moving and by fall or by September, uh, to put it in uh, something that Nigerians will understand, we will have a vaccine ready and the world will probably begin to get out of this crisis. Return mm -hmm. back to normal. Rufai, what do you think? Should, the, should they stay at home? Should they go back to school? I mean, uh, a parent has spoken there, so <laughs> uh, you, 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 can't, you can't top that. And, <laughs> And a parent many times over, you know, the, the truth has to be said. Caution and care uh, needs to be taken. I know a lot of people want to go back to school, but let's not forget that the number of people that have died as a result of COVID-19 in Nigeria, they are not just stats. They have families. They are people that had dreams, hopes, and aspirations. They're people that held high positions, and COVID took all of that away. Mm. And it has come to show that even your money can't save you when it comes to COVID. So let's be very careful here. Uh, there's no point rushing back to schools. I know the private proprietors who want to make money. They can't pay their members of staff. I watched an interview here on Arise yesterday about the teacher that was crying on social media. He was interviewed and he talked about what they were going through and the likes. But please, caution is the watchword. If Korea, with all its infrastructure and everything, can still shut back schools, if Israel can do the same and a couple of other countries, uh, I don't think we are ready. Yeah, it's not the, if we miss a year, it's not the end of the world. I'm sorry. For our lives. All right, then I think we we've all agreed. Maybe they, they should stay at home. Now, moving on to our next story, President Muhammadu Buhari has approved the naming of Itakwe Worry Railway Complex in Agbo Delta State after former President Goodluck Jonathan. According to the Minister of Transportation, Rutimi Amechi, the operational hub henceforth will be known as the Goodluck Jonathan Railway Station and Complex. The rail line has a length of 276 kilometers that links Worry in Delta State to Ajakuta in Kogi State. Reacting to this on Twitter, one user said, 
I wonder why this is being celebrated. It's not like they renamed it out of will. He only gave content in the sense of approval and as recommended. Another Twitter user said, wow, Buhari is so different, more than how people expect. I really adore his kindness, integrity, and generosity. May Allah guide and help him through. The final tweet on there says, this naming is suspicious. By the way, congratulations to good, good luck, Jonathan. <laughs> we it's are it's suspicious. Past, <laughs> it's because in the past, we've seen how supporters of both administrations go at each other, uh, accusing the Buhari administration of arrogating achievement to itself mm -hmm. for projects set in motion by his predecessor, Good Luck Jonathan. Um, I don't know of any laid down tradition that says you have to name projects or monuments after your predecessors. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's a noble gest uh, gesture that President Muhammad Buhari has done. But for me, it's beyond even the naming. It's what this means to the people, the employment is going to create, uh, the development for the country in general. Mm -hmm. Yes, congratulations to President Goodluck Jonathan. And what is in the case, of course, is President Buhari saying, look, there is no bitterness. Yes. And you recall that uh, it was President uh, Jonathan that started the railway project, yes. the revitalization of it. And in any case, <clears throat> this is an acknowledgement. The Minister of Transportation acknowledged it before that, look, the Jonathan administration started many of these projects, yes. and the President himself has acknowledged it. And I hope that later there will be a uh, other projects that will be named after President Jonathan. Yes. Well, thank you, Shaitan. Thank you so much. You are, you are doing time. very well. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. You are doing well. Fantabulous. Fantabulous. Fantabulous.